Okay, so um, I can still still my hear myself in a double loop. That work? It works sort of. Sort of? Okay. Okay. Okay, so back to some examples of is there no loop? I can hear it, but okay. Um, so it's confusing to me because it's running, coming back to me. Let me try and uh, ignore it. Okay. <laughs> I am muted. Muted. You are muted. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it says microphone on. But I don't know why. I started with uh, with with microphone off. Uh, what is this? And then I don't know what it is. Is this is there a way to mute it? Okay, maybe now it'll work by magic. Say so. Well, you, we don't hear you, right? Okay, good. Maybe? Oh, because you hit that, you know. think? Because who knows, right? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, I want to talk about the um, the contact structures, and here were some examples, and now we're, uh, I'm sorry, I got a little distracted. So um, just basic facts about contact structures is that our boot theorem says us that all contact structures are uh, locally homogeneous and all locally look like the standard contact structure that we had here. Um, on the other hand, Bennekin in 1980s, uh, in early 80s showed that there's uh, contact structures on R3 that are not uh, standard contact structures. So um, if a contact structure is like, contains a disk like the one we see here uh, in a picture, um, then um, this, this is called an overtwisted disk. The contact structure is called overtwisted. And if a contact structure has no disk um, that looks like that, then it's called tight. So uh, this dichotomy between tight and over twisted was introduced by Eli Arsberg, and um, he proved um, that there is a huge difference between over twisted and tight contact structures. Over twisted contact structures are classified up to isotopy by their homotopy uh, class as plane fields, and um, in every homotopy class of plane fields, there is a contact structure. On the other hand, tight contact structures do not exist in every homotopy pl plane, uh, uh, in every homotopy class of plane fields. And uh, in uh, some homotopy class of plane fields, there are tight contact structures that are homotopic as plane fields, but are not isotopic as contact structure and not sometimes even isomorphic as contact structures. So the early examples uh, are due to Giroux and Eliasberg and Polterovich, and they were on T3. And uh, Paolo Liska, who is giving the next talk, and I, back in uh, probably 1995, but it got published in 97. Publications always took a bit of time. Young people now know it takes even longer. But um, uh, we had examples of homotopic structures on homology spheres uh, that are homotopic as plane fields, but not isomorphic. So anyway, uh, this is a, just a short history to introduce basic questions, which are to construct, recognize, and classify tight contact structures. In the realm of constructions, Eli Ashberg, um, uh introduced this theorem where he uh, recognized the uh, contact structures that we call Stein-fillable, Stein 
which live on boundaries of Stein domains, um, that, which are certain kinds of complex symplectic manifolds. Uh, but the way to think about them by this construction of Eliasberg is to think about them as obtained as uh, adding two handles along uh, Legendrian knots in S3 or in, uh, after adding some one handles to S3. So um, Eliasberg and Gromo proved that all the fillable contact structures are tight. And here I, I talked about Stein fillable, but there are several kinds of fillability. And um, here's uh, some differences that were established throughout history. So tight contact structures contain weakly symplectically fillable, which contain strongly symplectically fillable. And this difference is about uh, how the contact structures and the symplectic structures inter interact near the boundary. And then the, the smallest uh, family is the Stein fillable contact structures. And there are these differences established um, by uh, Edna and Honda between tight and weakly symplectically fillable, Eliasberg between weakly and strongly symplectically fillable. And um, here is uh, in red, uh, I'm talking about the contact invariant. In 2005, Gigini used the contact invariant uh, developed by Oswald and Sabo to uh, show that there are strongly symplectically fillable manifolds that are not Stein fillables. So I want to talk about the contact invariant. So uh, in 1997, um, Kronheim and Rocca published a paper, Monopoles and Contact Structures, that introduced uh, an invariant of contact structures in, in monopole floor homology. And uh, in probably early 2000s, but paper published in 2005, Oswald and Sabo defined an analog of this invariant in, Higert floor, in their Higert floor homology. Um, in the paper, Higert floor homology and contact structures. So the invariant I want to talk about today is the refinement of this Higert floor homology contact invariant. So in order to do a definition of it, I have to say something about the uh, standard classical contact invariant. So first of all, Oswald and Sabo, of course, uh, defined uh, Higert floor homology for a three manifold. Um, and if they defined various flavors of it. And for a contact manifold, M3xi, uh, in the Higert floor homology with various flavors, they defined a contact element. So um, I'm today going to talk about the contact invariant in the HET floor homology um, and its refinement. So, um, so you can just think about HET everywhere where you see HF if it's not written. So um, the properties of this invariant are that if C of Xi, uh, if Xi is over twisted, then C of Xi is zero. And the other property uh, is really comes from a, 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 a one of the main theorems in that paper, except for the theorem that uh, the definition of this invariance doesn't depend on various choices made, is that if, uh, M prime Xi prime is obtained by Legendrian surgery, uh, so adding a two handle with a particular framing along a Legendrian knot in M Xi, then uh, there is a cobordism that's induced by uh, this surgery between M and M prime, and this cobordism induces a map on Higert floor homologies, and this map takes the contact structure invariant of Xi prime to C of Xi. So if we remember that Eliasberg said that all Stein fillable contact structures can be obtained by Legendrian surgery on a link in a three sphere, then we know that if M xi is Stein fillable, then there is this cobordism from S3 to M, and the contact structure of xi is mapped onto the contact structure of S3, and um, from easy uh, cal you know, super easy calculation is that the contact structure of the standard, uh, contact invariant of the standard contact structure is, is non-zero. So here is a theorem of Oswald and Sabo that uh, C of Xi is zero for an over-twisted contact structure and C of Xi is not zero for a Stein fillable contact structure. 
So clearly there was a, you know, a, a natural couple of questions to ask is that if contact structure is zero, is Xi then over twisted? And the other question is, uh, it is the answer is no. And uh, there are these examples uh, that I kind of alluded to in the beginning called uh, uh, contact structures with Giroud torsion, which keep the contact um, structure tight, but uh, have zero contact invariant. On the other hand, if C of Xi is not zero, can we conclude Xi is fillable? And the answer again is no. And um, there are various examples, a lot of people, many of them here, methods of proof, um, often bordisms uh, are built to examples that are known to uh, be not Stein fillable and uh, so, uh, so sort of ad hoc and clever, various clever ways to find, uh, to prove, still usually and often using in some way the contact invariant, but proving that Xi is not fillable. So here's a little bit more straightforward way uh, to put, to prove sometimes that a, a contact manifold is not Stein fillable. So um, we define an invariant O of Xi, which is either a non-negative integer or infinity that we call spectral order, um, such that this O of a tight contact structure is zero, O of a Stein fillable contact structure is infinity. And uh, it, this is a little confusing statement, but uh, O of M can be detected from a given open book decomposition. So we don't have to like worry about uh, open book decompositions of, uh, with different uh, pages, but I'm gonna talk about it in a second. So wh why is this, why is this a theorem useful? Um, calculating this invariant O is very difficult, unless we can show it is zero or we can show it is in infinity. Calculating lower bounds is extremely difficult, but uh, finding upper bounds is not that hard sometimes, and so what can we do with just upper bounds? Well, uh, if we have an upper bound and it is not infinity, then we can conclude that the, manif that the contact structure is not Stein fillable, um, even when the contact invariant is actually not zero. So I'll give you some examples of that. I promised the definition, and uh, because O is a refinement of Higgard's lower contact invariant, this is somewhat of a long story that has to mention the definition of the contact invariant. And so um, the contact invariant uh, can, uh, is defined as follows. So um, C of Xi is an element in Higgard's fleur homology of the three manifold with opposite orientation, but we'll just ignore that. And, um, there is a theorem of Giroux that says that every contact structure uh, correspond to certain family of open book decompositions on the manifold. And these this open book decompositions that are used then to construct the Higer decomposition and, and read off this contact invariant. So quickly, um, what's an open book decomposition? Um, starting from a different direction, I'm going to say, first of all, if we're given a pair of a surface with boundary and a diffeomorphism of that surface to itself, which fixes the boundary, then we can look at S cross zero one and mod out by an equivalence relation where we send point X one and identify it with point H of X zero, we identify all the points uh, with different T and T primes uh, when X is on the boundary. And so when we collapse this boundary, we get what we call a binding. And uh, in the neighborhood of the binding, we have this like open book picture, that's where the open book name comes from. And you can see from here that 
we can cut along two opposite like planes in this open book, pages in this open book decomposition and get a uh, Heger decomposition. So if we cut our um, S cross zero one in half, we get, because S had a boundary, we had get handle bodies and in, in each of these handle bodies, we find compressing disk that gives us a Heger diagram. So when we're coming to this uh, Heger decomposition from the open book decomposition, the, this Heger diagram has a particular uh, form. So uh, the, the red handle body uh, has this nice set of arcs that come from the curves alpha along which we cut. And the beta handle body uh, has uh, a, a form where these blue arcs are H of the, of the red arcs. So um, it's hard to really uh, be precise about this in a short period of time. But if we have, so here is an example. If we have, so this example is where the surface is the genus one surface with two boundary components. And the H is uh, the composition of the twists around curves A, B, and C. And uh, so if we, if we uh, did the picture um, like, like that, we would have, a, uh, we would have to cut this surface into a disk and then uh, look at where our red curves are mapped to and uh, get uh, this right hand side to just see what the uh, contact invariant is. Where is the contact invariant here? It's this special point. Uh, it's the intersection of alpha and beta curves and in the picture where we just concentrate on the page and the picture on the page, um, those uh, points appear in pairs at the ends of this uh, alpha arcs. So anyway, um, once we have this picture um, of the Higard diagram, then Ozat and Sabo had defined the Higard floor homology uh, by looking at this chain complex with chain groups freely generated by tuples of intersection points of alphas and beta curves and with the boundary map uh, counting certain uh, pseudo-holomorphic curves that realize certain domains in, in the surface where the domains have uh, some number of boundary components on the red curves and some number of boundary components on the blue curves and you know, they may have genus, but um, that's, that's the sort of the picture we, when we do this count and, um, and we count uh, all the domains from different y's that, uh, that start at x and go to y's by this formula. So this is, um, the definition of the boundary map on this chain complex and uh, the Oswald and Sabo prove that uh, the homology of the chain complex is independent of choices and so on. That's the higer fleur homology. But what, when we have a contact uh, structure and we construct the Higer diagram as up here, then, then there is a contact point, there is a special point, which is the intersection of alpha and beta curves where on the, on the portion where, where the picture is standard that defines the contact invariant. So now with this uh, out of the way, I want to talk about the definition of O of uh, the spectral order of the contact structure. So what we do is we introduce a filtration on this boundary map. Um, and this filtration is considered by, uh, is, uh, it comes from considering a certain complexity on this 
domains A. Okay, and the complexity of domain A is uh, involves the, the def this following definition. We're going to define the complexity J plus of A by saying that we're going to add the Maslow index mu of A minus 2E of A plus the difference of the order of X minus, or the size of X minus size of Y, where this, by the size we count the number of cycles in the, in the permutation of the element uh, where X is a tuple X1 through XD of intersection points of alpha and beta curves. And if we think of XI living on alpha I, then we look at what beta curves they live on. That beta curve, um, that define for, defines for us a certain um, permutation associated to X, and we count the number of cycles in that permutation. So in particular, if we think about the contact invariant X psi, what is its order? So um, because the contact invariant is defined to be the homology class of this special point where I intersect the alpha curves with its, with its associated beta curves, what we see is that uh, the permutation is just the identity and therefore this uh, is just the number of curves in the, in the set of arcs needed to cut this down. So there is a reform reformulation of this uh, in terms of uh, a Lipschitz formula and we get for Maslow index one domains J plus of A in, in, in more local and, uh, and um, combinatorial form where this NX of A and NY of B, uh, this, should, this is supposed to be A, uh, are uh, in terms of some sort of local multiplicities of the points X and Y at the corners of X and Y. So, uh, of the domain A at the corners of X and Y. So for example, if I have some XI, that's a, a, an intersection of alpha I and beta sigma of I, and the domain A comes in like this, then this NX would be one quarter. On the other hand, if the domain came in like this, then this would be three quarters and so on. So it's very, very combinatorial. So why am I talking about this J plus? Uh, because it turns out that the J plus of A is an integer and not just an integer, an even integer. And so um, what we can do is we can split the boundary map of HF uh, by uh, taking each one of these guys to be the sum like we had for the boundary map in standard Higer floor homology, but sum just over the things that have uh, J plus equals L. So, so the boundary of any uh, X splits into these boundaries and uh, what we get is um, more precisely the following. So we are going to uh, introduce a more complicated uh, complex by tensoring our standard, our standard complex by uh, F of TT inverse, and then defining the boundary map. So splitting the boundary map into D0, D1, D2 components, shifting to the left by L. And so when we have a situation like this, we can do filtration. We can introduce the filtration on this uh, complex and um, by taking FP, summing everything from P to the left. And uh, what we see is that uh, we get uh, you know, a filtered complex for, and we can talk about this, 
we can talk about the spectral sequence for this complex, and we can define the order of uh, this uh, complex to be the smallest k such that the contact element x xi is dies in the k uh, page of the spectral sequence. So um, it would be nice uh, if this was all we needed to do because then we could, yes. Sorry? The filtration doesn't involve the contact structure, but the filtration is like not, uh, it depends on everything and too much. And it, it doesn't, if you, if you just do the homology, it's just like not really invariant. You can't really, we don't really know how to make that filtration invariant under anything, okay? Right, yeah, so it's even worse. It's not just, it's even when we just, you just restrict to the contact element, uh, things uh, still depend on choices. So for example, if you have an over-twisted manifold, then it is known that you can choose a, an open book that has an arc that's taken to the left. And so that in the, con in the, in the picture for that over-twisted manifold, there is going to be an arc and then there is going to be a, a domain, simple domain with O equals zero that kills the contact element. So it's gonna get killed on the first page, so O is zero, okay, for that choice. On the, unfortunately, not every open book for an overtwisted contact structure has such an arc. So, but you may still hope that you still get uh, O equals zero, but no, it's not true. So here's an example. This is an open book with a three times punctured disc and with the twists as noted here. Um, so I'm just giving an example where, which we ran into. Uh, we, you can carefully study the whole picture on, uh, for the Higgard uh, diagram for this H and you can find that there is actually a J plus equals two domain, that's the only thing that kills the contact invariant. So we know the contact invariant is killed, so we know in some level it's gonna get killed. And it actually gets killed with J plus two, and so uh, from this, the O is one. So we don't have independence of the open book. Okay, so, well, how do you fix when you don't have independence? Well, you just define it away. So, so we define O of M of Xi to be the minimum over all open books of O of S, H, A, J, and now it's an invariant, right? So, well, it's not a very calculable invariant. And uh, we don't, you know, it might just be nothing. On the, uh, so what we do prove is that um, there is the independence of the almost complex structure, like for the uh, for the Higgard fluor uh, in homology, there is also independence of S of H and A. So first of all, then the thing I said is that we have independence of the open book. We have an independence of the open book as long as we allow ourselves to take more than just the basis of arcs. So we're gonna have to have uh, A be not just cutting to a disc, but maybe to a whole bunch of discs. How does that solve that question, uh, that, that, that problem I had before on, that, on, on, on this example? So if we add a parallel arc here as I did this green arc, on the right hand side you can see this immersed disk and this immersed disk is a domain with j plus equals zero that kills the contact invariant. And so once I allow myself to have extra arcs, then I don't have to uh, change the open book SH. That's nice in some sense, but it's uh, not nice because we don't know how many arcs we have to add to achieve the actual minimum. So 
there is a problem. So there's a problem with calculations uh, is that we don't have an upper bound. So now we have an invariant, now you want to calculate it and because you have to take an arbitrary number of, of extra arcs to take a minimum over, it's hard to find the lower bound. So if you found O equals zero, then that's the lower bound, you don't go lower. So, so that's a situation where we can do calculations. We can also deal with Stein fillable manifolds. We can show that, um, like for the standard the contact invariant, the O uh, for uh, Stein fillable manifold is special. And it is, uh, as for the standard contact invariant, their Legendrian surgery in some sense honors the contact uh, situation here, it's not a class, it, but what we have is uh, that if M psi is obtained from psi by Legendrian surgery, then uh, we have that uh, O does not decrease, okay? So in particular, with calculating that the O of the standard contact structure on S3 is infinity, and knowing that the Stein, um, Stein fillable manifolds can be obtained by a sequence of Legendrian surgeries, what we get is uh, this result that O of a Stein fillable manifold is infinity. So if we have an example where we find that O is finite, well, maybe we don't know how much it is, but if we find an upper bound, then we know it's finite, then we know the contact manifold is uh, not Stein fillable. So here's a couple of examples. So the, the example that I sort of plopped before, and maybe I can talk about it here a little bit more. So I'm looking at a genus two surface, a, a genus one surface with two boundary components, and we're going to cut it up into a disk by putting an arc a1 here, and then putting an arc, maybe. So, so I'm going to think about, about this uh, here, handle made by identifying those two guys. Uh, think about cutting this surface along this green arc, green thing here. So um, I have the blue arc, A2, would be... Uh, like that, and then we have this green arc that goes and cuts along like this. Okay, so we cut our genus one surface into a disk, and with uh, this identification, I can draw this genus one surface uh, picture like this, and so now I have my uh, twists, my uh, invariant, my, my uh, open book is, a, uh, the, the diffeomorphism is obtained by twisting to the right along this boundary component, this is A, and along this boundary component, this is B, and then it's twisting to the left along C, which is like a curve maybe here. So when you do these twists and apply them to these arcs, then you get this picture, where the arcs, original arcs, are dotted and their images are the full arcs. And then um, we're looking for domains that, uh, whose boundaries alternate between straight and curly arcs. And we want those domains that hit the contact invariant. So what's the contact invariant? The contact invariant is this pair of points, we should really think about one point, x1, and then there is uh, this pair of points, this pair of points is x2, and then there is uh, this pair of points, or x3, okay? 
And so then we're looking for uh, the domains um, that might hit the contact invariant. And so very careful analysis of situation. Um, after very careful analysis, we can conclude the following. Here is this, here is this uh, point Y, which is a triple X1, Y2, 1, 3 that I did in, in green here. And from X1, Y2, Y3, there are two domains and only two domains that leave it. So when we calculate the boundary of X1, Y2, Y3, we can see that uh, this gray domain sends it to X1, X2, X3. And there is this one other domain that sends it to uh, X1, W2, W3. So in short, the, the, the boundary hat map of Y is the sum of these two domains. Each one has only one representative because uh, that can also be proved. And so what we see is that the boundary zero of Y is the contact invariant. So we see that O is zero. On the other hand, it's a, a fact and uh, it follows from some work of Conway and some work of Hedden and Plamenevskaya that C of Xi here is not zero, okay? And it's not zero because this element Y bar doesn't get mapped by the standard boundary head to the contact class. You need to like ignore the higher complexity terms in order for this to happen. So there is a, some more examples here. There is a whole family of examples uh, on genus two surface with two boundary components and uh, with this uh, here uh, monodromy map with a triple twist around this boundary component, one twist around here, one left twist along C and any number of twists P along this D. So the fact about this manifold that this is negative one over P surgery on a horizontal curve in the circle bundle with all our class four on the genus two surface. So here the Xi zero is a unique virtually over twisted contact structure on Y zero, which was shown to be not fillable by Liska and Stipschitz. Again, the same theorems um, I mentioned before give that this contact class is non-zero, and uh, we prove that O for all of these manifolds and contact, for all of these contact manifolds is zero by a careful argument that shows that this domain is the only, uh, gives us, is domain with J plus equals zero that gives us the O equals to zero. So, um, so the, I wanna say that J plus equals zero domains are pretty simple. They're immersed, uh, they're immersed uh, polygons with uh, what we would call naked corners. So, um, so here is one of them. So here is y1, y2, y3, y4. And uh, there's an immersed polygon going down to the contact invariant, which is x1, x2, x3, x4. So that's it. But the, the thing is that when that it uh, um, that you can prove that it if you minimize over all a for a given open book you will have achieved the minimum. You don't have to do minima over open books. That was that statement that I made that you can figure out the invariant from any given open book, 
as long as you increase the number of A's. That's, a, that's our theorem. So, and, and that was what that example was that I was saying is, you see, I don't have to change the open book for this over-twisted manifold to get J plus, uh, to get O equals zero. I just need to add a, add a curve. So this is sort of a throwback to Andy's sort of collapsing domain. So, um, yes, I, I would actually, I just realized I, f I forgot to say our uh, idea for this J plus came from uh, a, a similar t uh, thing by Mike Hutchins, who was doing something. Uh, it, it's an appendix to a paper of Lachev and Wendell on the, you know, my brain just stopped in, in like in contact homology, right? So there is um, torsion in, in contact homology and there is a paper there where he does something for ECH that's um, like supposed to be a parallel to their thing. And so um, we were motivated by that to actually do this. And, and I, I think the, the thing that we have here is some sort of calculability with a hands-on Uh, we thought we had them, and then our proof fell apart because at some point we thought we can add, a, just, what do we have an upper bound of number of arcs we need to add? And uh, as I said, it's extremely hard to prove the lower bound if you can keep adding infinitely many things. So we don't know. We suspect there is, but we can't prove it because we can't figure out how to impose lower bounds effectively. So, in principle, it's possible that it only really takes zero and infinity values. So maybe, maybe just one other thing. Yuha and Kang uh, uh, looked for O in, uh, for in, in sort of like a, a, a region that would describe Giroud torsion, and they found uh, that there is upper bound, if all the definitions work out, like, because they are not all worked out yet, then uh, you could see that that O is finite. So that would be another way to see that anything that contains G root torsion is not fillable, sign fillable, 